to this computer. Ooh, we're being recorded. How was the importance of bringing Ernest? Oh, it's pretty cute. I, I enjoyed it. Good. Um, yep. I uh, I just realized shortly before I joined you, the guy could tell that the actor portraying Lady Bracknell, I think her name is, yeah, was was in fact an actor, not an actress. But I didn't uh, and I didn't, didn't realize who it was until I checked the cast list after the after it was over and realized it was Neil Robertson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think in the he was amazing in the role. I thought, oh gosh, he's fantastic. But then, now I realize, okay, well, yeah, it's Neil. Of course, he's fantastic. He's a great ability I, to turn his hand to anything. Oh, yeah. Uh, I yeah. saw picture Hello. advertising Neil in that role and had to pop over to the video just to see Neil in that fabulous dress. Oh, yeah. So. <laughs> uh, I had to uh, watch my child wander through the magic of Animal Crossing. Or at least surprise him and read every single thing that comes up. So I was denied that pleasure. I, had <laughs> I think it's still up. Sorry? I think it's still, still up. I don't, they didn't do it as a live video. When I glanced at it, it looked like they had uploaded it to YouTube probably for tonight and maybe That's tomorrow. Cool. Right. It probably could still be watched. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, um, I might have a look at it later on. It was from about five years ago, I think. 2015. Uh, yeah. How long back? Sorry, Claire, what year? 2015. Oh, I didn't think that far back. Because I think it must have been 2013 or 2014. Savage Rose did it. Uh, because it, in that same space. Because I lit that one. And that was uh, Barrett Cooper's Lady Bracknell. And Neil was uh, Ernest. Or uh, I think he was Jack Worthing. Mike Slayton was... Uh, who was Mike Slayton in that? He was Algie. Uh, it was, oh, memory don't fail me. Natalie Fields was, I think, Gwendolyn. Who was Cecily? Maybe Jelaine Havens? And, um, yeah, uh, and, and, more, and I think Kelly Moore would have been uh, Prism. Oh, Kelly. And Monty Pretty and Jerry... Uh, Jerry Rose between them were the two manservants, Lane and Merriman. Okay. Good show, good show that. But it's, so, a, it's a good show. I take it, it, it it's typical for Lady Bracknell to be played by a, a male? It depends. Um, it's not uncommon. Certainly in the last 30 to 40 years, it's been fairly common to have that mm -hmm. happen. Although not always. Um, my great desire uh, in, I'd say, the mid-90s when it would have been appropriate. Claire, you are so too young for this. Uh, would have been- I was alive for part of the mid nineties. What part of the mid nineties? 96? And after. Uh, <laughs> the mid nineties are 94, five and six lady. Don't, 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 don't push it. I was alive for part of that. I was alive for 96, at least the second half. Part of 96 <laughs> or all of 96? May 29th and onward, I was there. And I have there a very a good memory. For a sixth of the period of which I speak. Be gone, child. It is part. It is part. I did not misspeak. It, it, it is to the letter of the law, yes. But the spirit, hardly. Anyway, you won't remember this at all. Uh, you might recognize the name, but the cachet then and now would be different. So, uh, Gary, you remember Jerry Hall? Jerry Hall. Married to Mick Jagger? <laughs> ah, yes, of course. Yes, yes. Still quite mm -hmm. the looker and quite the name, as particularly on our side of the Atlantic, in around the mid-90s, but she sort of faded after that, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of uh, fame anyway. But the ideal for me would have been to see Lady Brecknell played by a guy uh, in drag uh, to be, being Jerry Hall. American, or sorry, Texan accent, tall, willowy, long blonde hair, uh, and that the whole kind of demeanor, the attitude, and I think it would fit really well into it. Mm -hmm. However, it then became really popular, and it's like, oh, well, there's no point in wanting to do this anymore. Um, but yeah, no, oh, God, I was in that years ago as Charles 
and Tony Pike was cho- not Tony Pike. Tony Prince was chargeable in the uh, production that Savage Rose did. Uh, the uh, priest. You okay. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, I would have guessed good, good, good Galway. Of course, you'd have guessed good Galway. <laughs> uh, that that is an Irish advert reference. But uh, yeah, no, um, that would have been the the way to do it back then, as far as I was concerned. And about four years later, I think. They did, because, you know, there's a big shortage of male parts in the, uh, the canon of Western theatre. So uh, the Abbey Theatre did an all-male production um, with a guy, the guy who played uh, Lady Bracknell was a, is a big name in Irish theatre, a guy called Alan Stanford. And he also, I think he directed it, played Bracknell, and also played Oscar Wilde at the beginning of the show. <laughs> Because, you know, there's not enough roles for men anymore. Oh, yes. It's terrible, terrible, terrible. Yeah. So, Did anyone see the interesting, um, the Globe streams their 2018 Hamlet? Not yet. I'm keen to. Is it gone I, yet? I don't think so. I think it's up until the 19th, I think I saw. But I very much enjoyed it. It's not my favorite production I've seen, but it was definitely solid, and they did a lot of playing around with gender and costumes, which I quite enjoyed. And the acting was superb. The Globe can be very good with that. Um, is this the woman who took over as artistic director that was controversial? Apparently. No, this is the one after the controversial one who... She was great. Has... She ranks as the worst theater production I've ever seen. <laughs> Ooh, what, what was it? It was, was it was the much ado about nothing with white people or white passing people playing Mexicans and people of color in playing like background characters, which was just so cringy. And the whole way they treated Dogberry was just it didn't make a lot of sense and was also pretty cringy. And they changed Shakespeare's words to make them more understandable. So, <laughs> it was the lady after her, and I thoroughly enjoyed her work much more. And she also played Hamlet quite well. So I I remember reading the woman who was in charge, who was controversial, and some of her rationale for some of the things she was doing. I think her name's Anne Rice. I, I think can't. I think she wrote the Vampire Lestat. Uh, I can't remember honestly at all. <laughs> but I believe her call correctly, and I could be wrong. Her overall view was she had some really great ideas. The execution, from what I hear, did not help those ideas. But again, it's a long time since I read uh, what was going on there. Uh, Hamlet is on for two, for about another. It's uh, apparently it debuted on the 6th and it's going to go on for two weeks. So, what's that? The 20th, it's on till. I must root this out. Somebody, uh, Paulina sent me a link to a Lithuanian Hamlet that's actually quite good. Ooh. Really intriguing. Uh, it's in Lithuanian with Russian subtitles, just in case you were hoping to watch it and understand everything. I'll have to brush all my Russian. Understandable. I know this play well enough at this point. I was working on a production of it every single, like, five out of seven days a week for the two months before we went into isolation. I'm really well versed on my Hamlet at the moment. You you ought to have a read of that link um, that Liz sent last week. Uh, I put it up about the universality of things like Hamlet. And one of the things I love about Shakespeare's plays is, yeah, it's not the universality that everyone's expecting. Hang on, let me put this link up here someplace. John and I watched Throne of Blood this past week. Oh, that is the best version of Macbeth, in my opinion. So, Gary, just really, really for, solid. For, for the record, that is uh, Akira Kurosawa, the Japanese uh, uh, filmmaker. He, he had an obsession with Westerns and Shakespeare. And he gave us The Seven Samurai, which eventually becomes The uh, Magnificent Seven. Right. And then he also gave us three amazing takes on Shakespeare. Bad Sleep Well What's is the third. Good. Sorry? I know about his Lear, which I think is called Ran. What's the third? The Bad Sleep Well. 
it's very much updated and set in a business world. And it predates by, I think, three or four years, uh, Throne of Blood. He does not have the same budget. It's one of the more interesting versions of Hamlet, I would say. But okay. it takes plenty of liberties with it. But um, He took some liberties with Throne of Blood, but I think they worked very well. Yeah, no, and I, th I think the choices made were, were the right ones for the culture and for, um, you know, for the story he wanted to tell. I will I say, I'm, I have a lot of respect for Kurosawa as a filmmaker. Mm -hmm. The acting style that he goes with much with the Western acting style of that period is not my favorite to watch. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, I, so he's not one of my favorite in terms of liking, but in terms of respecting, I have a lot more respect than preference, if that makes sense. It does. You can admire a writer or a filmmaker and not agree with them. And I can understand why that was necessary with the currents of the time. It makes it clearer in black and white film where things are less clear, so you have to exaggerate a bit to make them understandable. It's not my favorite, most enjoyable type of film to watch, but I thoroughly respected Throne of Blood, and that one I did really enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, Ran is an interesting one, because it's, it's King Lear, basically, and it's three sons, and it's very feudal Japan. Throne of Blood and Ran, Gary, so, so you're up to speed, are both set in, what is it, 16th, 17th, 14th century Japan, somewhere along there. My knowledge of <laughs> Japanese uh, period costume is similar to my knowledge of American football period costume. Um, but it's set in feudal Japan, pre-Meiji Japan, and um, it's filled with ritual and what have you, particularly Ran. You've, have you seen Ran, Claire? No, we're looking at potentially renting that. We've got a free trial on Criterion Channel and Canopy. And we found Throne of Blood on both of those, but not Ran. Throne of Blood is sensational. Uh, for me, for me it, is, it is literally the best uh, film version of Macbeth. Uh, I love what they did with the witch. <laughs> mm. Well, I mean, this is the thing. Got a, cre got a creepy guy with a creepy voice just turning a spinning wheel, and it's awesome. Hmm. Well, what, what it does well is it kind of fits in from what I'm told. Again, I'm not an expert in Japanese folklore. I, I, I know a little bit about Japan, but not an awful lot. More about the, um, the Japanese theater of the era. So my understanding of, say, uh, the works of Ziami helps me with Throne of Blood a lot. Uh, although it's, I feel less present in Ran, but that may be just me. But um, yeah, I mean, culturally it makes sense. It's, it's better than uh, the Orson Welles Macbeth, in my opinion. Of the English language Macbeths, well, have you seen any of these Macbeths, Gary? No, I have not. Okay, we will not make this a Macbeth-only chat, although I could <laughs> easily... Uh, I, I've been teaching, I tend to teach it when I'm doing um, community college level stuff because it's a good one, it's a short one. There's a really nice video online which shows the opening scene, which is when shall we three meet again? Uh, five different ways from 1970 onwards. Um, but yeah, so I'm quite fond of it. But uh, I, I must ask Claire, hello Liz. Ah, there, Liz. How are you doing? Wait, wait, hang on till I get a picture of you. Uh, scratching your nose so we can have something for the cover of the show. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. I'm so sorry. I got that changed eventually. Like, I clicked up and was like, no, no, must fix that. Thought I fixed it, hadn't. <laughs> How are you today? Sorry, talking to me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're talking. Sorry. I, hi. I'm sorry. I missed the audio if anybody was saying hello. Hi, I'm, I'm good. Sorry I'm late. I lost track of time. <laughs> You're grand. They're, uh, they, there's not much you'll have missed for the test. <laughs> uh, we've, we've been rolling oh, up. Yeah, your uh, Kira Kurosawa, you're, you're in good shape. Yeah, if you know your Kurosawa, you're fine. Oh, uh, OK. Phew. We were talking about uh, Throne of Blood, which I was saying is, for me, probably the best version of Macbeth from the angle of uh, reinterpreting it for an audience. We, is there any film version that, 
Anybody? Uh, I know Gary hasn't seen any. Claire, Liz, any film versions of Macbeth you're particularly fond of? Um, I like Patrick Stewart's. It is Ooh. scary as shit, and one of my favorite ways they did the wit that I've ever seen doing the witches. That was the nurses, yeah. Hmm. That was the one with the nurses, the Dominic Drum Ghoul. Yes, the one with the nurses. Yeah. I have not seen yeah. that, and I've. I saw a bit of one that was on Netflix that was released within the past two or three years. I watched some of it and wasn't, didn't hate it, also wasn't crazy about it and ended up not finishing it, but I did really enjoy Throne of Blood. Who was the uh, Netflix one, do you know? <sighs> not off the top of my head. There's a few different versions knocking around. There's an Australian one, which is about 2006 with Sam Worthing, Worthington, whoever, himself, who was Avatar. Mm. Avatar plays Macbeth in that one and set sort of drug, uh, drug dealers in Australia. And the witches in that are three redheaded schoolgirls going around breaking up shit. Uh, the When Shall We Three is set in a graveyard and they're just defacing gravestones. So it was a great opening. The rest of the film, eh. Not so good. Um, there was the... Uh, I think one. Michael Fassbender. That's the one, yeah. Uh, Kurzva, Kurtzell or something was the director. Uh, Marion Cotillard is Lady Macbeth. That, that's the answer. It's not a question. Um, and um, I think The Witches... Or no, I don't think that was the one I saw. Or no, it was, because David, I was like, I don't think I remember David Lewis being in that. And then I was like, no, wait, I remember him being like, wait, David Lewis is in this? I didn't know he was in I haven't seen it. Uh, I'd have to pay to watch that one, I believe. But that was the one that was on Netflix, you say? Yeah. And it has the long it's... scroll at the beginning telling us where we are and how life has been. It... Yeah, it was Netflix or Hulu, something that we had, and I was just looking for what Shakespeare things are on here. Is there any? And found that. And like I said, not my favorite, not crazy or innovative. The cinematography was really pretty. Mm. That looked good. But not, so, not bad, not revolutionary. Uh, when I did my, um, when I did a Shakespeare class back in grad school, um, the versions of Macbeth's in the books that we, uh, that we had to buy, uh, this particular version would talk about various ways that people did different scene, famous scenes throughout, oh, cool. um, which was super interesting, but it gave me uh, one of my favorite ways I've ever heard of somebody doing the witches, even though it said they had to stop doing it because it freaked out the audience too much. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> so what you do is you cut the lights in the theater. Um, and you have speakers put on the stage. Uh, and the witches deliver their lines backstage, you know, act one, scene one, when we three meet again, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the very end of the scene, when they say hover through the fog and fill the air, they, move, they moved the speakers from the stage over the audience, mm. like flying over them. <laughs> it was amazing, but apparently they had to stop doing it because it freaked the audience out so much that they're just like, no, we, we can't do this anymore. Wow. But I want to see that, Macbeth. Yeah, that's the one you want to see. Yeah. After, uh, Actors Theatre did one a couple of years ago that it started out pretty effectively and then they kind of, it became less effective as the play went on, but they had three little girls with hair over their faces, a la horror movie playing the three witches. And they screamed a lot. And at first it was like, ooh, this is creepy. They like had them do the creepy crawl thing. Mm -hmm. um, but then in the later scenes, they had them just randomly screaming and also like two feet away from Macbeth. And it was like basically touching them. If they were really scared. There were things that kind of broke the spell throughout the play, but in the beginning it was a pretty effective choice. And I think translated well our idea of the witches into modern day horror tropes. Mm. Yeah. 
I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> I, I saw with the class and a guy behind me was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> when they came out and started doing the crawly thing. It was pretty creepy. Ah, uh, yeah. You can't, you can't beat sort of long hair ring type horror in terms of just general creepiness. Although, just bring up the question of why do we find it creepy with a woman or a girl doing that? Why do we find children's laughter somehow more effective in a horror film than in a comedy? Uh, there's a lot of sort of questions that go with that. And I mean, you go back to that time. The women in Macbeth, with one exception, don't come across very well in terms of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, representations of women, uh, I would say. Lady Macbeth is brilliant, amazing, powerful, far more powerful than her husband. But it comes after a uh, come unsex me here. And again, it's, it's a role I would imagine most women who have aspirations in Shakespeare would want to play. Uh, Lady Macduff is actually a really good character, a really underrated character in my opinion. But um, if you're in a production, cut that scene. I've seen that done. I hate when they cut that scene. I think that's important. There's a there's a step by step by step. It's like with uh, Richard the Third. Richard the Third. I'm going to kill a few people, but they were jerks and they weren't much fun on stage. So you're you're with them. Now I'm going to kill some more people. Oh, that's a little bit more risky. Now I want you to kill the the, the children. What the, the the children? Yeah, I want you to kill the children. Okay. And then all of a sudden, we don't get so much. Uh, one-to-one -one chat between the audience and uh, Richard III, and it takes that turn. Similarly so with Macbeth. If you don't have that, you know, it's killing the old man who's the king. Fair enough. The servants, well, they're barely people. Um, <laughs> kills Banquo. Well, he's a threat, but the child escaped at least. And I know he was talking about killing the child, but, you know, I'm not going to go that bad. We're not going to kill a child. We're not going to kill a child on stage. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, spoilers on a 400 year old play there Gary um, but yeah. they kill all the children if you, if you cut that scene I think except you, the one that gets away I think you rob the play if you cut that scene especially if you rob a decent female part you know unless you're playing Macbeth female or Macduff female and Lady uh, Macduff male or something like that in which case well you're still losing a, a powerful scene, I think. Could be wrong, but I mean, at the same time, I, I, I was in a, I was part of a production that did cut that scene, and the and the reason why was just time. Mm -hmm. uh, you cut I mean, Hecate as well, I hope. Hmm? You cut Hecate as well, I hope. Uh, oh yeah, he Hecate yeah. was was. I mean, the, I think the general critical consensus is that Shakespeare didn't even write it. So I, I don't think I've ever seen a production that included that scene. I have seen a couple. It really? is not a great addition to the play. No. So the Hecate scene, Gary, just to bring you up to speed. So witches in Macbeth, and they've uh, led him on. They, they have him believing, blah, blah, blah. You probably have a vague idea. Most, most of the time, they cut the Hecate scene, which is this weird, odd, not particularly congruent poetic scene with this like queen of the witches or king of the witches, depending on how people tend to cast it. And I've seen it done once. Uh, Savage Rose did it. Savage Rose did every scene in Macbeth, which is not a great idea for the stage. <laughs> no, <laughs> ironically. I think the previous Macbeth I'd seen before that was uh, done in the RSC with Anthony Sher and Harriet Walter in the leading roles. Harriet Walter was amazing as Lady Macbeth. But they did it without an interval and the whole thing ran two hours and five minutes and it went by so fast. There wasn't time to breathe. Um, and it wasn't the case that I was rushed, but it's a great example of why cutting works really well when you know what you're doing. You know, uh, really, really powerful. Yeah. But uh, we'll move on a little bit from Macbeth because we want to talk about tragedy generally. And I'm guessing, did you get a chance to see the King Lear, Gary? 
Yes, I did watch the King Lear. Good. Uh, did you see uh, uh, Kentucky Shakespeare's? Uh, what do they call their their apprentice team or whatever? They did a version of Macbeth just this past season that I did see. Did they? Yes. Yeah. I they didn't. Do, they didn't do it at um, Central Park. Um, the production I saw was at another city or state, well, city park, I guess, somewhere out in the touring out. production kind of thing. Kind of a touring thing, yes, for 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 more their not their core acting yeah. team. Was it the Globe Players, the high school kids? No, they weren't high school kids. Um, it must be one of the parks tours. Yeah. Last year it wouldn't have been the parks tour. I know last year was. Last year they actually did Macbeth for the Parks Tour. Yeah, yeah. So it might have been a couple of years ago. You know, I think it was last year during the summer sometime, maybe the spring. I forget the time frame now, but anyway, yeah, so I did see that. Well, good. Well, you have as good an idea then. Sorry for if, if I'm talking down. Just don't That's want correct. anyone to feel, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> No, this is why we are not doing time in the bathrooms for quite a while. <laughs> I think I was I think I was bad talking Pericles, but I meant to be bad talking time in the bathrooms. Cause shoo, of all the plays I've read of Shakespeare, that one was like you could tell the end of the play in the first scene and nothing interesting happened. Oh, that's not helpful. It's interesting because I it's one of those plays that every now and again I hear somebody making an impassioned uh, cry for. This is the time for time in of Athens. This is a play that speaks to today. And it's like, nobody does that for other plays that are not nearly as hard to get through the first scene of. Yeah. It, it is not a great addition to the, uh, the world of, of doing Shakespeare. So you saw the King Lear, you saw the King Lear. Did you have a chance to see it or you've seen it before? Nah, I didn't get a chance to see the uh, the Kentucky Shakespeare King Lear. I mean, I've seen... You've seen it before, though. Let's see. I don't remember. I don't know the number, but I, I've seen a few King Lears uh, mm -hmm. before that. Not as many as other tragedies I've seen, but mm -hmm. I like... You, you, enjoy, you enjoy a bit of watching an old man die horribly. <laughs> of course. Who doesn't? <laughs> Gary, I would imagine. Do you enjoy watching an old man die horribly? Uh, uh, no, that would not man. be on my uh, uh, like list. <laughs> um, also, he yeah. dies of a broken heart. Let's not get ahead of ourselves. <laughs> that is true. Sorry, yeah. And spoilers for anybody watching who does not know. Um, <laughs> uh, Wait, yeah. people die in a tragedy in Shakespeare? <laughs> People live in a tragedy in Shakespeare's generally bit, uh, more headline news. Um, how did uh, you've had you seen the had you seen it live back in the day, uh, Gary? When it was on originally, um, not <clears throat> cat really wants attention right now. <laughs> so it would appear. No, I, that's not what I did not see that one live. The, the Lear. <laughs> how did you find it then? Was this your first uh, encounter with it? This was my first encounter seeing Lear, yes. And uh, um, honestly, I mean, I, I obviously I, I could follow the plot and the story and everything, but it, it really didn't move me. It didn't, it didn't really seem like a classic, powerful tragedy. Um, I don't know if it was the production because I have no other productions to compare it to. Um, but yeah, it, it just, it didn't move me very much. That's, that's okay. <laughs> not guilty. I hear, I, I hear this like, I didn't like it. Oh. Can I say that? You can completely <laughs> hate it if you like. Yeah. Um, and we, we, we don't have to spend all day talking about it. Claire, did you care? <laughs> did you enjoy it? Uh, overall, I definitely enjoyed it. It is my favorite, my favorite use of Gloucester. Mm -hmm. I loved the gender bending that they did with this. I think it's so effective because I, the first times I had seen Lear, I remember being overwhelmed, especially in the first scene a bit with like, 
oh my gosh, these are a lot of men that seem to be roughly the same age and they all have place names and it's hard for me to tell them apart. <laughs> no, you didn't and, grow properly oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> and so having Jennifer uh, play Gloucester, not only is she an incredible actress, but I think it worked both in distinguishing that character and also in making this play in some ways more symmetrical, having the king and his daughters and then Gloucester and her sons. I think that was very effective. That was possibly my favorite part of the production. I think John Huffman was a solid leader. Um, I have a lot of respect for his acting. It doesn't tend to come off as showy ever. It's very natural and doesn't feel like he's acting, and I really admire that. Um, one thing I actually didn't like, I have a lot of respect for Neil as an actor, and I really liked him as Edgar, but when he was doing Poor Tom, his acting is very... Melodramatic? Very melodramatic, and I don't know if it's... It is my favorite take on that character. And I don't think that's so much his acting, but maybe his acting in this production or with that character. It's not my favorite character that I've seen him in. Interesting. I have strong feelings about the play myself. Uh, Liz, I presume you've seen a number of Lears, as you were saying. You, uh, you, enjoy, you enjoy seeing the harrowing of old men. Um, <laughs> No, but I mean, John, genuinely, you, you, this is a play you, you enjoy a bit, yeah? Oh, uh, yeah. I, it's, it's not the one I've seen. The, I mean, I've seen 10,000 productions of Much Ado About Nothing, but I've seen, I've seen a couple of Lears, and I enjoy it. Ooh. I've seen about uh, 15 or so King Lears now at this stage, if I include this one. Uh, I generally don't, uh, when I'm talking about plays, I tend not to talk about film versions. So it's, including this one, I feel is difficult for me because um, the power of a show is in being within the audience and experiencing it for me, which is, for those who know me, a preamble to me absolutely slating a show. Um, I did not like this production. I really aggressively did not like this production. Now, this is not a comment on the actors or necessarily the directing because again, a film version of a show is very different from being there and in, in the space. Um, and in the space, it may come, Neil's performance might come across very differently. But yeah, I felt it was, using a 19th century uh, pejorative term, his character became somewhat hysterical as it went on. I never felt he came back from uh, being the uh, uh, Tom of Bedlam character as Edgar. And I felt that the place suffered for that. But that wasn't the only place. Uh, hi, John. Bye, John. Martin says hi. Bye. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I enjoyed I, Jen and John, Jen Pennington and John Huffman are fabulous uh, performers. Really can do really great work in the right roles. I, I would have reversed them. I oh. thought. I loved the idea and I, I dig it. The, uh, you know, one mother with sons, father with daughters, but it felt like Jen's performance had the power, had the uh, authority of a Lear, whereas John's felt more likely to yield the way that Gloucester does, if that makes sense. I felt that for me was a big problem. Um, I'm trying to remember who the fool was. Oh, it was Tom Luce. I thought Tom Luce was splendid. <laughs> no, it's an odd thing to say. Uh, I, I wish there was more of Hallie in her performance. I thought uh, Abigail Maupin got, um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Goneril spot on. I wanted a little bit more from what they did with Regan. Again, I watching this on a film as opposed to being there and, and in person you get a different performance every time and especially seeing as their mics where you're facing at the right time can change things or where the camera's pointed can change things but um yeah i was i, I liked kent kent was really good 
Um, I felt the Edgar Edmund thing just didn't come off for me. Um, what else can I slate about it? No, that's not fair. But uh, yeah, I've always felt that Kentucky Shakespeare are more comfortable when they're doing comedy because we don't have that experience as an audience going to tragedy where it is performed large. We're more used to it in a small contained space, I think. And that Central Park does not lend itself here to that kind of uh, performance. So I, I never feel that Kentucky, and I'm not saying that I would do a great job either, I never feel they get the tragedy quite right because they never drive the comedy in it hard enough, <laughs> oddly enough. And they, I, I don't know, I, I, feel, I feel like they just missed the mark on a number of angles. So, but again, I've been lucky enough to see some amazing actors in, in the, the various parts. I've, I've seen one guy, I think it's Oliver Wendell Ford, or uh, Oliver Ford, oh, I can't remember his name now. He'd play, I'd seen him as the fool and Gloucester and eventually seeing him as Lear. It was really interesting because he didn't, he never felt like a Lear to me till I saw him as Lear, mm. you know, so. I almost went to see the female Lear in New York last summer. Was that Glenda so. Jackson as Lear? I think so. I was very close to getting tickets for that or Hades Town. My family went in to see To Kill a Mockingbird, and I wanted to see something else, but just didn't end up having the time and needing to coordinate other people became a thing. Yeah, other people ruining everything for everyone else. Uh oh. Martin, the time has come when your microphone starts messing up. <laughs> I was saying, other people ruining everything for everyone else. <laughs> so, I know, so we've all seen Lear, we've all seen one or two more of them. What would be your favorite of the uh, Shakespeare play that you'd describe as a tragedy? I'll Hamlet, say Lear. easy. Hamlet, please. <laughs> Macbeth. Macbeth, Gary? Yeah, Macbeth. Ooh. Why? Oh gosh. Take your time. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> work away. So I was I was thinking about this the other day. Just Macbeth gets there. Shakespeare does something about Macbeth to give it this sort of nightmare like ambiance, and I'm not really sure how. I think it's something to do with uh, the order and the space between each scene more than the scenes themselves which is super odd and, you know, brilliant and different. But uh, Macbeth feels like, you know, horror coming out of a fog in a really unique and different and exceptional way um, in ways that the other tragedies just, other tragedies are more, it's just the story with from point A point to point B. I'm still not sure, again, I'm not sure how he does it, but Macbeth has that extra horror ambiance to it that really draws me to it. Have you seen Kurosawa's Throne of Blood? I have not. Um, the way you described it, horror coming out of a fog, having just seen that interpretation, Kurosawa kind of runs with that. You can get a free trial on the Criterion channel and it's on there and I would recommend seeing it, especially if Macbeth is your favorite. The what channel? Criterion channel. It has okay. like critically acclaimed in a lot of foreign films. I got it to watch Celine Siama because I saw a portrait of a lady on fire and became obsessed. <laughs> but Just for full full disclosure, I thought you said for a moment, I got it to watch Celine Dion. <laughs> no, Celine Dion. As Siama. a channel that covers a lot of horror, that makes sense to me. <laughs> but Horror coming out of a fog. Kurosawa really ran with the fog in in Throne of Blood, which is an excellent interpretation of Macbeth. So just hitting that, I was like, if you haven't seen that, try and see that. 
I'm noting down the phrase. I like the idea, horror coming from the fog. Well, it's, make... it's a recurring theme, you know. You end act one, scene one with fair is foul and foul is fair, oh. hover through the and fog in the, the yeah. air. And, you know, the setting in Scotland naturally lends itself well to the imagination for what the weather is like. And, you know, Macbeth's introduction, he says, never as foul, foul or fair a day as I have seen. And it's the, the way, the times when the characters enter, it's like they're in the middle of something often. And it's like, you know, they exit in weird places too sometimes. So it's like you never exactly know who you're going to see next or what's going to happen. Mm. Um, where it's, anyway, it's really, it, the, a lot, I've seen a lot of good projections just run with the fog theme and it works. It just really works. It certainly does. The, 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 the I, I mean, the images you conjure there as you're describing are wonderful. But that is it, exactly. I mean, for me, I always kind of went with the, the fact that you literally start with chanting. Yeah. You know, and that, that kind of, you're creating a, like a, almost a, a ritual. And in this case, if you like, if you like a satanic ritual, and you know, you get it in the first scene, you get it in the third scene, and then it doesn't, it doesn't come in at a place where it makes sense again. It just like pops up out of nowhere. Uh, every time we go to the witches, there's no kind of warning or order that you, I mean, in most pieces you generally get sort of a symmetry here or some kind of balance was like, no, boo, here are witches, aha. Yeah. Oh, now here's ghosts. No, you didn't expect ghosts, did you? This is meant to be a feast. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're right. They, they do sort of enter and exit scenes um in the middle of a thing you know when banquo yeah. and um macbeth walk in, in the third scene uh they walk it, they, they, they've been wandering and conversing you know it, it doesn't feel like hey we're meeting it's like no we're walking and chatting like, Whoa, what's this exactly really good point and it's also just i mean i personally I don't hate Hamlet. I just feel like it's not a play that I connect with very well. Is he That's whines that? and it, it, mm, I'm sorry. See, I no, came no, to I'm Hamlet. Sorry. I came the first time I read Hamlet, I was an angsty 15-year-old and I was like this is the best thing ever written. I need to memorize this speech about how the world is a quintessence of dust because this is how I feel during finals week. <laughs> and I could, I mean, there's, all, there's other levels of Hamlet that I absolutely love. I find very interesting the Hamlet's concern over the soul and metaphysical questions of that nature, like, and the difference between appearance and what appears and what is there's a lot of themes that I really gravitate to it's so but but also the the whiny angsty intellectual tortured soul like nerdy high school me just found that and connected to that in the way that I was supposed to connect to Catcher in the Rye <laughs> nobody is supposed to connect to Catcher in the Rye that book should be banned <laughs> hey, if, if high school teachers didn't think that kids would connect to that, they would stop assigning it. Uh, so high school <laughs> teachers need to be banned too, fair enough. Um, I mean, one of the things we, we get... Uh, I love the fact that you don't like my Hamlet. I think that's great. <laughs> because one of the things I always tell my students is, Listen, Shakespeare's taught badly generally at school. Sometimes you're lucky and you get a good one. I hated Shakespeare in school. Oh my god! And and I and the and uh, as a 15, 16 year old, I was getting King Lear, and our way of learning King Lear was we read it in class, which is difficult considering you know half the class could barely sight read their names, and then um, you've got them sight reading Shakespeare then learning off quotes. And if you get the quote slightly wrong, you end up having to write it out 20 times. Like, 
no, this is not how you yeah. learn this shit. Yeah. And so it was only after I finished school that I went, oh, actually, I like King Lear. And now it's my favorite. Um, Why is King Lear your favorite? Sorry? Yes. Why is King Lear your favorite? Um, probably because I'm a white male from Europe. Um, it, to me, speaks of the post-Second World War world. You know, uh, a world where the major powers have torn apart everything for their whims. And then ordinary, again, back on my side of the Atlantic, white middle-class males are, well, I wasn't middle-class at that time, um, ordinary white men are kind of, uh, uh, well, what's left? Well, is this the promised end? I think is the line. Where, where is the bloody new copy of it? I, I'm no good at remembering quotes, so I always have books. Books are better at remembering quotes than I am. Where is this thing? Something like, is this the promised end? And that, for me, is incredibly powerful. Uh, whenever I look at the world of King Lear, I look at a world that has been destroyed, a world that is torn up and then is further to be torn up. For, uh, you know, we are, we, the, you is know, ordinary the people, your, ours flies to want, uh, ours, our to the gods flies to wanton boys. They, uh, is this the promise and that is correct. Yeah. Oh, um, away. It's Kent. Yeah. After Lear says, howl, 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 oh, you're men of stones. Had I your tongues and eyes, I'd use them so that heaven's vault should crack. She's gone forever. I know when one is dead and when one lives, she's dead as earth. Lend me a looking glass. If that her breath will mister stain the stone, why then she lives. And then Kent says, is this the promised end? Yeah. And Edgar says, or image of that horror. See, rather than have, okay, I do have my Shakespeare shelf right there, but I also have the internet and Googled, is this the promised end, Lear? Yeah. I mean, old, uh, there's me, there's me copy of the one. Uh, mm -hmm. The thing ultimately for me, looking at King Lear, is growing up in Ireland, which is a, literally, by definition, a third world country. Uh, certainly was back then, as uh, non-aligned. And also a, a, develop, a developing country by other definitions. Um, we were sort of dealing with the fallout. And what I see when I look at the play is I see the, uh, the whims of the main characters. But you get this one glimpse. You get these glimpses here and there of the underclasses, which would be my lot. Uh, the servant uh, who kills Cornwall. In, in this tiny, tiny uprising. It was my great joy to get to play that servant. He's got like four lines or something like that. He gets to kill a lord. That's completely unheard of. Uh, you know, we have Kent trying to be down with the ordinary folk and he just can't be. So it's, a, it's an odd relationship. I think it is a post-Holocaust uh, post kind of world. It is a world where humanity has been discarded for power. And a world where we have stepped aside from uh, human values in favor of values for uh, the values of avarice, the values of, um, I can't think of the word, of, of ownership really. And that for me was the Europe I was growing up in as, you know, uh, dirt poor. Uh, that was the Europe I would see when I, when I finally got to travel around. So the more I've lived, the more it speaks to me uh, as an uh, a dissertation, if you will, on what happens when the people who are over us do not care for us. They're doing, busy with their own petty squabbles and their own petty squabbles are, if they were ordinary people, very interesting and very human squabbles. You know, how do I deal with my daughters? I'm old and I'm getting older and I've got a child. And, you know, am I doing the right thing as a father? This is a sort of a new layer that's come in. Am I engaging with my child properly? I would like him to love me, but I also... I don't want to turn him into a Regan or a Goneril, somebody who will just say, 
whatever uh, so please my lord and uh, say what he thinks I want to hear. But he's six, so he will anyway. So it's kind of like, oh God, is he Edmund? Is he Edgar? Is he Goneril? Is he Regan? Is he Cordelia? Hey, you know, at the end of the day, I kind of want him to be the King of France, which was <laughs> apt with my name, uh, which is also a part I got to play. I got to be the King of France in, in uh, Lear 2. So I can say legitimately, I have played the romantic lead in King Lear and the heroic lead in King Lear. <laughs> and between them, approximately 70 lines. <laughs> yeah, so. So, yeah, I, I'm a big on King Lear. Don't know why. Apart from all those reasons I gave. Apart from those reasons, I have no idea why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other than that, it's meaningless. Yeah, you know, and Other than all, that. <laughs> all of those extra layers that you talk about, and, you know, and obviously you've, you've seen it multiple times i've only seen it the one time you know all, all those all those layers were completely lost to me in the production that i saw i mean it was just a sad story about a guy whose children you know turn on him and <laughs> and everybody dies in the end so you know <laughs> not everybody not everybody i know but <laughs> we weren't that lucky uh <laughs> that's not fair that's not fair it's funny though I did get to see an interesting production of Lear, um, I think four years ago, the Chicago Shakespeare Company did it. Mm -hmm. And it was set in modern day, they used some Sinatra and echoes of Sinatra throughout the play. That but one of the, one of the coolest things, they had a really good take on The Fool. It was one of the few times The Fool was like a very, sort of wacky effeminate character at the or no the fool was kind of wacky and effeminate and kent went from being like a well-dressed person to like a biker dude and it was one of the few times in shakespeare where an actor transformed and i was legitimately like oh i wouldn't actually think that it was just the same actor but he's wearing a hat you'd never recognize him <laughs> <laughs> but one of the coolest parts of that production was the set design because they had like this really tall, like, um, it wasn't a flat because it was like 40 feet tall. It was like the back, meant to represent the back of the house or the castle, and there was a window up at the top. And when Lear went crazy, he walked out from that backdrop, and actual, well, not actual, water started to fall on the stage like rain, and it was epic. And then slowly you start to see that back part just tilt forward and Lear's raging at the sky and it falls around him and through the window. And then he's standing surrounded by this wall that's just collapsed and reveals like this desolate landscape with one tree behind it where they go for the, for the parts where they're just wandering outside the city limits. And that's that element of scenic design and just, the production quality of being able to do that was just like mind blowing. <laughs> I think they may have stolen that idea from the Almedia a few years ago when Jonathan Kent directed, because I've seen that before. It is powerful. Also, it is a step sideways from Spider Man Turn Out the Light. That's another discussion. Liz, you're about to say something a while back. Dark, Martin. You turn, turn out the how can you turn out the dark? <laughs> well, my, my title is better. <laughs> the true story. Um, back when Hamilton was really, really big, um, and it was all anybody was talking about, people kept asking me if I'd listened to the soundtrack yet. And I hadn't, because I wanted to set aside time to do it, because I usually listen to music while I'm working. And I, after a while, I got so annoyed, I started tell, deliberately confusing Hamilton with Spider-Man Turn Out the Dark to just see how far along I could get in the conversation <laughs> or someone noticed. Did you see Spider-Man as a matter of interest? I did. <laughs> okay. Was so, it any good? Sorry, now uh, we're to the real meat of tonight's discussion about tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... 
The sets were absolutely incredible. Their set designer deserved every single Tony because it was just really creative the way they set up the sets to like mimic comic book pages. It was very creative and cool. Um, the stunts were very impressive. That's about all I remember. <laughs> it was, um, yeah. So every time my parents come up to visit me in New York City, they get tickets to see some kind of show. But unfortunately, it's usually like a Mamma Mia type show. And one time it was Spider-Man Turn Out the Dark. This past time they came up, actually, we, uh, there was this musical based on Bob Dylan's songs that was oh, trying yeah. to be... Girl yeah. from the North Country? Yeah. I saw that in London. What'd you right think? Before I um, I enjoyed it. The, I really loved the music and I loved the costumes. The story felt a bit like it was someone who had read about characters like this in a storybook or in an old novel. Yeah, I can um, see that. It didn't feel I like... It boring as shit. <laughs> it didn't feel like a genuine look into these characters the characters didn't feel like real people they felt like someone that the author had read about if that makes sense yeah that totally tracks although um, right after i saw that i went and saw the andrew scott uh hamlet where they also use dylan and that's probably the best piece of theater i've seen in my life oh <laughs> <laughs> so that, that day that day is like covered with a rosy glow for me <laughs> was it so i didn't hate that production but I, again it wasn't one of my favorites i found what they were trying to do interesting in a lot of ways but i don't think the story was completely successful yeah um, I'm also, okay, I'm coming into this with a lot of bias. I, for my day job, you know, I'm an accessibility engineer. I make the internet accessible for people with disabilities. And oh, a lot cool. of my friends are just, yes. Um, a lot of my friends are disabled. A lot of the places on the internet where I hang out are full of disabled folks, um, which is an awesome place to hang out because there's awesome dope people. And that play featured a plot point where a cognitively disabled man gets murdered by his caregivers. And it's just sort of waved off like, oh yeah, that's, that's an understandable thing for something to happen. And I'm, me, I'm over here going, what the fuck? This is horrific. You need to treat it that way. But instead they're just like, oh yeah, you know, you understand. It, it was hard to take care of him, so it's totally understandable. And it's just like, no. Good. Yeah. Right. We, yeah. We're sensibly talking about Shakespeare here. <laughs> well, that ties in because a lot of times people try to do something innovative with the script. And I, I say this as somebody who tries to do something innovative with anything I do, uh, with varying degrees of failure. But um, what I, I've seen people in the before before time, i.e., you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, you would see, not commonly, but you'd occasionally see, like, oh, Richard III, he's in a wheelchair. Like, that, okay. And they get, it's like, oh, hang on, wait, no, no. We already have the difficulty of the, you know, the idea that Richard III is deformed. And, so, you know, all the, all the dialogue going on, you know, so they reckon in real life he had kyphosis or scoliosis. I can't remember which. But the more disabled in the eyes of the average day-to-day uh, -day, uh, ableist you make him, the more, when you think about it, it becomes, what are we saying here? Is he mean because of his disability? Because his deformity is what leads him to be unable to live in the time of peace, so he wants war. If we're making him like a wheelchair user, or something else? Are we doing some? Does that mean something? Well, um, I actually, I, I've read a lot about what, you know, disabled studies and disabled people think about Richard III, and you will be shocked to hear the conversation is complicated with mm. lots of people having diametrically opposed opinions. Um, but it's, 
I mean, I've also heard of some really great productions with, okay, so disabled actors in general um, are horrifically underutilized. And uh, in the Globe Hamlet, they, they apparently double cast it as you like it and Hamlet. And they do have a, uh, a deaf actress who has a large part in As You Like It. So just throwing that out there for the Hamlet, the Globe streaming, they actually did a good job, which is rare. <laughs> Continue. I get that out. Actually, my, my personal headcanon in the version of Much Ado about, not, uh, the version of Much Ado that I've been directing in my head for the past 10 years is um, that Claudio is either deaf or he has a speech impediment, but that's a side story entirely. Um, but when you consider how horrifically underutilized disabled actors are, some, so you eventually have to start asking the question, does it make sense that Richard III is almost always played by an able-bodied actor pretending they're disabled? Yeah. And maybe that's fucked up and not okay. Um, that's, what, that's the kind of one I'm thinking of. If you have yeah. somebody genuinely bringing something of themselves to it, fair enough. Or, you know, well, it's in this day and age, we can do better. I mean, you know, I remember there was this discussion a couple of years ago when Brian Cranston was playing a character who used a wheelchair. And an actor was saying, listen, whenever they make a biopic of, of Brian Cranston's life, I'm never going to be able to play him. Uh, so why the hell should Brian Cranston be able to play me? Mm -hmm. uh, so, anyway. Also, side note, uh, if they ever release a video of Spring Awakening that they put on Broadway a couple years ago, go watch it. It is absolutely phenomenal production. I've read about it and I want to see it. Is this the Vedakind or the musical? The musical. Okay. I, they, yeah. they said it. Um, they, they ha half the actors were deaf. And the play was performed in both English and American Sign Language. And they incorporated a lot of deaf history. And as somebody, I was learning sign language at the time and learning about all this. And it was, it was, it was amazing. It was absolutely incredible. Also, Ali Stroker's uh, Broadway debut. And she recently won the Oscar for the Oklahoma That Fucks. The <laughs> I don't follow um, the films, so what? that's what they that's what they nicknamed it. Um, they put on they recently revived Oklahoma, and I'm yeah. so relieved that I missed seeing it. I kept meaning to see it, and I didn't. But they put a very modern spin on it. And uh, if you ever get so, Ali Stroker actually. Um, she plays the character who, who sings I'm Just a Girl Who Can't Say Edo No. Annie. Sorry? Edo Annie. Edo, yeah. And um, she, she actually went on a couple late night talk shows and performed that number there. Go check her out. She's incredible. Uh, she, oh my God. She's just wonderful. I look forward to watching her through a career. Good. Yeah. But she's oh, yeah. in a wheelchair. Miss that part of it, Martin. I don't know if you knew that. No, no, I, 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 I don't know. I know more probably about what's going on in the Dublin or London stage at the moment than what's going on in the New York one or the Chicago. Unfortunately. Um, well, uh, nothing's going on right now. Have you know? <laughs> I'm the expert in current theatre in Broadway. Um, yeah, no. Uh, I, uh, I, I, I am not somebody who knows much or cares much about the musical theatre world. So for me, um, the, last, the last thing I got to see in New York, and I haven't seen much there, was Showgirls the Musical. Oh, geez. What? It was, in a it was in a gay club way out of the middle of nowhere. It was ran for about 12 weeks, and it was wonderful. It was... It was uh, Making a making a virtue of taking actual lines from the movie. Uh, oh. I think they have a oh god, one of the scenes I haven't seen the movie in years. Probably best that way. Mm -hmm. um, one of the scenes was uh, set in cafe. These are the actual lines they use in the movie. 
and they're literally doing the actual lines they use in the movie, and it's like. It was, it was fun. So, but that's like my musical knowledge in terms of con contemporary musical. Um, no, I think, I think the disability thing is important. And honestly, we're here, I'm not going to say in America, I'm going to say here, generally in sort of small town America, we are very slow. We've been, we've been having female hamlets since the 1740s. We've been having black kings of England since the 1980s. We've been having this random disabled people. I know that that's even more pejorative than I wanted to sound. I don't want it to sound pejorative. We've been having people with different uh, ability challenges, folks who have uh, sight impediments, hearing impediments, uh, walking impediments, even impediments, playing Shakespeare in Britain in um, the professional theatre since the, the early to mid 90s without, you know, making, oh, here comes Clarence, who now for some reason is deaf. Just here comes Clarence, and all of a sudden we're using sign language. That's, as well that's, as the words as well. We've had how multilingual Shakespeare. I've seen Shakespeare done with three and four different languages going on simultaneously Ooh. without English language translation. And here we have a difficulty getting to a point where, you know, outside of maybe the professional or semi-professional theory, we don't see females playing male roles in Shakespeare, never mind something more challenging. I think uh, you, some of you know Darren Harbour? Yeah. I can't, I think he was, he was meant to be the fool in King Lear, and I know he was meant to be something in a Richard III at one point. Uh, he's got a visual impairment he can't see, uh, I think, at all at this point. He developed it late in life. He's a wonderful dancer, and I've been lucky enough to cast him in a couple of shows. Uh, both as a character who is blind and as a character who is not. And he managed a fight scene as a sighted character without sight. Again, as a director, you need to work in a different mode. You need to be aware of, you know, it's like, I'm casting blind, no joke intended there, Darren. I'm casting blind and I will treat you all as the same. That doesn't work. It doesn't work for anybody. And, uh, but saying I'm casting you in the part that I think you're best suited for, regardless of various things, but these various things are going to be a factor when we come to rehearsal, you need to do that. And I think a lot of directors are frightened to have to go outside of what they know is going to be an easy job. If I'm casting somebody who has a sight impediment, in whatever it is, even if it's just like slightly short-sighted, it's going to require me to do certain things differently as a director or take certain uh, lengths of time more on certain things. And, you know, tough. That's my job. I have to get the best out of the cast. It's my, my, my job is not to uh, exclude. It is to make uh, inclusion possible. You know, I'd like to, I, I, I'm sad that we don't see more of that, which is why partly I th don't think we see more people taking risks with, uh, cross gender casting with cross racial casting, even uh, the the recent Hamlet production I saw at the Globe seemed to do a good job on many of those levels. Mm -hmm. Not only did they have um, women in male roles, they also had a at least male presenting actor playing Ophelia, which I thought was very interesting, and it wasn't played for laughs, which mm -hmm. was refreshing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it also threw into starker contrast all of the sexism that's thrown at Ophelia. They also had, um, they were casting people regardless of race, um, regardless of gender. I mean, with a conscious eye to it, but not oh, yeah. letting that limit the roles that people were in. And then the, I was reading up about how they cast it because they, they used the same company in Hamlet and As You Like It, so someone would have a larger role in one play and a smaller role yeah. in another play. And it, I, I was reading a review of both of them together after I watched one, and the actor that played um, Rosencrantz, or no, Guildenstern, the quieter one, which functioned very well in the play, was the one using sign language and is apparently a deaf actor, but in the other play played Celia. Mm. 
So got a large role in that respect and then a smaller role in Hamlet, but it functioned very well to have Rosencrantz and Guildenstern kind of using this own language between them. And sometimes other actors, either Rosencrantz or um, the person that the person that Guildenstern was talking to would kind of translate for the audience if needed, but it was done in a fairly seamless way. They had a few jokes with um, everyone basically being cool except Claudius being kind of awkward around them, and I think that kind of worked with the production. So they they didn't ignore it. They incorporated it into the production, but in a way that felt very much like it was embracing it. Mm -hmm. That's gotta that be the way. Sorry, Liz. So I was, I was watching this, this interview recently with uh, Leslie Odom, I think it was Leslie Odom Jr. And he said, he was talking about how most productions these days, they'll do colorblind casting and that's good. But what's even better is running stories that, um, that, that are, that are African-American stories. Mm. Uh, and, you know, not just for race, but also, you know, for gender, for disability, you know, and yeah. part of that is, uh, getting plays produced that are written by women and people of color and disabled folks, uh, rather than, you know, the, the same reliable canon all the time, but it also means, I mean, at least I think, uh, I was lucky enough to see the uh, Shakespeare in the Park, Much Ado About Nothing, uh, this mm -hmm. past, uh, with an all-black cast, and they, the production brought with it a lot of um, specifically Atlanta African-American community mm -hmm. uh, towns to it. Yeah. And it made different things ring out a lot in different ways. And it made different things make sense in just, the, it made the whole production phenomenal top to bottom, but also yeah. Yeah. just, it made it a whole new show with a whole new way of seeing this however many hundred year old play. Yeah. Um, and I think you can do that. And it's the same with Spring Awakening. So, um, the, I, this is like literally the first scene, so it's not even a spoiler. Um, the first scene is about, uh, features a mother and her teenage daughter who's starting to come into her own and they have the where babies come from talk. Mm -hmm. But mom, in the original play, mom is just so horrifically awkward and not ready for her daughter to be at this point in her life that she, she can't even like say the word vagina. She can't talk about it. She's just like, oh, you know, just you're with your husband and only your husband. And, and it's, it's special and it's important, but she doesn't actually say what sex is. Mm -hmm. And so later in the play, shocker, that comes back to bite them in the ass. Mm -hmm. um, in the spring oh, maybe not in the ass. Uh, mom <laughs> not the ass, no. <laughs> in the production of Spring Awakening that, that I saw, uh, there was also a language barrier between mom and her daughter. Her daughter was deaf, and mom just did not know sign language very well. So she literally just did not know the words to say what yeah. she needed to say. And, you know, most, something like 95% of deaf children are born to hearing parents and most of them never bother to learn sign language so yeah you would it's shocking but it's true um so this th this this kind of collective trauma in the deaf community of not being able to connect to their parents and not being able to connect to their family um runs really deep and it rung really hard in this with this whole disconnect between mother and daughter that ultimately led to such tragedy later in the play. Um, so like they took this play that was not intended to be a parable about hearing and deaf world and they turned it, it, they turned it into something so stunningly beautiful and poignant and ringing out in totally different ways. And I would love to see that happen more with more productions that 
you know, maybe not weren't intended for that originally, but with different communities can bring totally different ideas and mindsets to them. Well, certainly, and I've not seen all of it yet. That much ado you were talking about. I watched uh, maybe the first two scenes. Yeah. It's not in Shakespeare's language. It's not in <laughs> Shakespeare's time. It's as those people speak, because that's the thing. At the end of the day, a good script should work for humans. The yeah. universality, that article, by the way, is fantastic. Really, really <laughs> enjoyed it. But it does sort of, I, I agree with it completely because of, it doesn't make the point that I think the author was expecting it to make. There is a universality there. It's just the Irish view on it might be different to the English view. And man, uh, I can't, what country was he in? Wherever he was, uh, Kenya? What? No. She, she only said the tribe name. She didn't say the yeah. country. But, but uh, he didn't read it as Laertes selling Ophelia's body to witches. Isn't that uh, wonderful. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. But any good story about humans, ultimately, layers of it translate, and they get trans changed in translation. I mean, any given language you have. This is one thing that I love about growing up Irish. Is we grow up with two languages. You know, some more so than others. I was lucky enough to do well at Irish. And so you understand that when I think in Irish, I think, I think a different way. I have a different psychology. When I grew up in one culture and then moved to another, you guys, the English you think is different to the English I think. That's not one is better than the other. It just is different because of the conception of how things can be and so forth. And similarly, so growing up in a culture of Irish in the south of Ireland as opposed to the north, which was going through a civil war that we couldn't call a civil war, you got a different mindset. And so, of course, all the things that happen in Time and Athens, no, all the things that happen in Lear or Macbeth or Hamlet or Othello, there is a resonance with the human because they're actually pretty well-written plays, which we don't have to like. Um, but how it gets it translated into that culture, into that experience yeah. is so different. Which is why, yeah, it makes perfect sense that a play like Spring Awakening can read that way. Or it could read any kind of cultural way. I think America has done very well with Shakespeare, oddly enough, because there's not this feeling that I have to get the, uh, the class of the accent correct. I don't see too many Americans feeling like they have to do it in an English accent when they do Shakespeare, which is a problem we had in Ireland when I was growing up. That, oh, we're doing Shakespeare. We better have our best, our best English accent. I'm a lord. Of course, in Shakespeare's time, I'm a lord would be more accurate. <laughs> what I always wanted to do was Macbeth on the uh, set in the hills of Louth. And the hills of Louth are on the border with the north of Ireland. Because for me, Macbeth is a border kind of thing. There's gun running. There's a lot of uh, betrayal. There's a lot of uh, shifty kind of stuff. So you get a real Dundalk accent with it. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow. Uh, which would make sense in my ears and in Dundalk ears. But um, at that time in Ireland, there was no way we were going to do a Macbeth where people sounded Irish. Because that just wasn't right. Worst luck, we might even have some that were they were trying to sound Scottish. <laughs> Speaking of Macbeth, I haven't forgotten yet. Gary, why Macbeth? Oh, Sorry well, to yeah. Take a wide turn back. <laughs> because the the story of Macbeth to me was is so much more compelling and interesting than the others. Um, and it's probably, you know, I couldn't have said it as eloquently as Liz with the, the horror of the fog or whatever. That, because the production that I saw, the Shakespeare in the Parks thing, was by necessity a very minimalistic production as far as set design and, and things like that. But that didn't matter. I still, you know, felt the, the, the macabre element of it, the horror of it you know, the witches, the ghosts. Um, so, it, so it drew me in a lot more than, than a lot of the other Shakespeare that I've seen. And, and to your point that you were making earlier about 
um, Kentucky Shakespeare's comedies probably are more successful than their tragedies there in Central Park. And, and I can relate to that because the, tr the tragedies and the histories that I have seen there, they're interesting. And, you know, I appreciate the acting and everything and the production qualities, but the stories themselves don't really draw me in like Macbeth did. So that, that's why of the ones that I've seen, Macbeth is definitely my favorite. Yeah. Cool. One thing I'm always at pains to say is you're allowed to not like it. <laughs> There's this feeling I, I, I teach in an historically black college uh, here in Louisville or there in Louisville because I'm on the other side of the river. Um, mm. And yeah, you, you meet people and they've got, they're, they're already set against it because they've been told so much they will like it. No, you'll like it if you give it a chance. It's like, not necessarily, you know, um, what's the film? Uh, those Marvel movies, they're fine. They're not great. That's my feeling. If you love them, great. I'm delighted for you. I have this really obscure Yugoslavian movie that I love and you will hate it. And that's okay. It doesn't make it better or worse. I mean, there are, there are some things that are objectively bad, but I've, I've got uh, students who love Empire, but can't stand King Lear. It's like, cool, same story in both. One telling is reaching it, the other one isn't, and that's okay. How you've been introduced to something sometimes makes a big difference. And, you know, um, if I had a better teacher for school in English and in, uh, with Shakespeare, I might not care as much for Shakespeare now as I did because I had a guy who I hated. You know, it's, it's how you come to these things a lot of the times, I think. You know, and, yeah. Uh, I was never introduced to Shakespeare in schools. I don't know if that's a, a, an indictment of the school that I went to or what, but we didn't study Shakespeare. I've never studied Shakespeare in any kind of formal way. Um, you enjoy it when you come across it now? Um, yeah, usually. <laughs> then, in my opinion, that was a success for you. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I think that kills me every time uh, is I, I talk to, I ask the students at the beginning of the year, we do like two classes on Shakespeare because that is what we can manage. And the ones who love it want more. The ones who hate it may not even show up. And you know, I can't blame people because a lot of the time it's, it's a weapon. And I, one of the things I hate most in theater is I see sometimes people using jargon as a weapon or ability or and in terms of like acting ability or whatever or you know what you like as a weapon and if you're using educational bits bits of uh, knowledge and information as a weapon against somebody you need to get out of there in my opinion um, so I try to I don't want to say dumbed down Shakespeare because you know Shakespeare was always dumbed down by Shakespeare, because you know, you don't get a good dick joke in every now and again, the audience will turn on you. <laughs> um, and that still remains the, a, a variation on that remains my sort of, a whole mark of great literature is the quality of the dick or other vague sexual joke. You know, Milan Kundera, and I've probably said this before, he has in his book, The Art of the Novel, we can discuss Milan Kundera during our Kundera chats, <laughs> um, he's an interesting character, but he is accurate when he says, you know, if you want to get across a really important message, do it with comedy, entertain your audience. Don't be all serious and dread and dark because then you'll just scare them off or they'll, or, or worse, you'll turn them into suits. Yes, I, I really care for King Lear because it dispenses with the frippery of a dog and, and you know, the, the clowning is just... Ugh. No, there's clowning in there. Maybe, maybe one of the reasons why I'm drawn to Hamlet is 
I think it's one of the funniest tragedies other than, I mean, you get tragedies like Romeo and Juliet that are basically a comedy for the first half, but they're a romantic comedy, and I tend to be less interested in those both in Shakespeare and modern filmmaking. Mm. Um, I'm sure Gloves okay. But Hamlet is hilarious if you play it correctly. Um, or really badly. Yeah, <laughs> yes. But all of the scenes where Hamlet's just acting crazy and messing with people, if it's done right, it's just comedy gold. Yeah. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstern can also be played very funny. In the production that I was working in, they were hilarious. They were always goofing off and they were like partiers. So when Hamlet's like being all depressed and he's like, Denmark's a prison, they're like, <laughs> well, we think not so. And it worked really, really well. And yeah. I think it's the type of comedy in Hamlet, the messing with people, I tend to enjoy more than the... In Macbeth, there is some comedy, but it tends to be more isolated in the play. And with Lear, there also tends to be more comedy, but it's just with a specific character, mostly. With It's mm. coming off of the fool. One of the things I really appreciate about Hamlet is there's a lot of comedy in the first act, but it's not comedy coming from this one actor that's supposed to be funny or this one character randomly coming in that's supposed to be funny. It's humor that comes from the main character just messing with people. And there's such joy in that. Mm. <laughs> <Bigger's> hysterical. <laughs> Oh, I, right. I, know. Oh, I just, uh, I don't know. My favorite types of stories are the ones about people who make decisions that change their lives. And Hamlet's whole thing is he doesn't make <laughs> fucking decisions. Ever. <laughs> and I just, I don't know. I, uh, that, that whole sort of, and I, I understand it's not exactly navel-gazing because he's got a lot to be, he's got a lot on his mind, fairly so, the whole do I murder someone or not thing. It's kind of a big decision. But uh, I just want to say, every time I watch it, I just want to be like, to just stop, just do, to just pick one. Just, just pick well, a decision. You know the greatest non-Shakespearean Shakespearean line should be for that play. Do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> Tamla doesn't try, though. He just gets really upset about it. <laughs> then he gets this whole speech about let my thoughts be bloody or nothing worse. And then he goes the opposite direction <laughs> he's supposed to go. Because the man is incapable of doing anything but talk. And again, it's totally fair. The whole do I murder someone, it's a it's a heavy decision. Although it doesn't seem to be too heavy when it comes to murdering Rosie and Wildenstern. That's just, you know, mm -hmm. Tuesday. Uh, Although arguably, he comes back very changed after he uh, does away with them. Who were his friends? As we are told at the beginning. Yeah, no. Uh, my, I mean, my, favorite in, my favorite interpretation of the play tends to run heavily on I don't, I don't like it. I understand, like, it's, the line is not in the production that I was working on, but also it's an hour and a half long production for school. So we cut a lot of stuff because we needed to cut a lot of stuff. But one of my favorite lines that I think is really important to the play, if you, wanted, if you want to address that waffling, especially if it's not an hour and a half long production that feels very fast, because if it is longer, then the hesitation becomes more prominent than if it is a very quick play. Mm -hmm. But I think if it's going to be longer, you need to have in the line, the ghosts that I have seen may be a, the devil that tempts me to damn me. So the whole thing of like, the hesitation coming from, I need to figure out if the ghost is truthful or not. That gets me through the first half where he's being indecisive. And then as soon as he's figured that out, he's like, sweet, I'm ready to kill people. Shoot, he's praying. That's convenient to keep the plot going. And then he comes back ready to kill people. Um, but, yeah, but I can see productions just... that... 
I can see productions that don't emphasize that hesitation, that do, can I even trust this ghost? Is this ghost actually my father or is it just trying to get me to kill someone? That productions that don't emphasize that aspect, I think can be frustrating because then it doesn't come across as clearly why he just doesn't sneak into his uncle's room and kill him. <laughs> I know, but him was whole. Oh, he's praying. I can't kill him now. I went to Catholic school for a lot of years, man. I learned a lot of stupid rules. Not one of the stupid rules is you can't go to hell if you go to hell if you die while you're praying. I heard a stupid rule once that said you will automatically go to heaven if you wear this magic necklace. Um, I feel it. Yeah, which uh, I. Yeah. That, that they need scene to be washed. I, that scene I can see having a lot of frustration with. Although, also because I've been hearing the script so much, I can also cite there is a point that kind of directly points to the opposite of that. When his father comes, when the ghost comes back, he's like, I was cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhouseled, disappointed, unannealed. Basically, I didn't get the last rites, so now I'm in hell. So if he hears from someone... I didn't get the last rites and now I'm in hell. He's like, I'm praying. Oh, that has consequence on what happens after you die. So there is very valid frustration with the, that scene, but only yeah. because I am way more familiar with that play than anyone should be, especially at this moment. I can also cite the evidence that kind of points to why that might be there. So the question I have then <laughs> that is, makes sense. Claire, is the Stockholm Syndrome you've got <laughs> so the funny thing is when I was before COVID-19 happened and I was like I went into the production like this is my favorite play and then we went through three solid weeks five days a week of rehearsal and then we were going to perform the play um four to six times a week for two months and I was uh, I looked at Amy the director and I was like it'll be interesting to see if this is still my favorite play when I get out of this. And then like, I was like, even after having done that, like, oh look, there's a new Globe Hamlet production. Time to watch that. It's still my favorite play. It, it if anything, has made it more my favorite play. <laughs> so, um, I don't know if that's Stockholm Syndrome. I was ar I already had a questionably unhealthy love for Hamlet before this. I listed in my top in my top four or five literary works along with Jane Eyre, um, the Harry Potter series, um, To Kill a Jane Eyre, Harry Potter series, To Kill a Mockingbird, Hamlet, and um, Patti Smith's Just Kids are my top five literary works. So it was already up there. It's only gotten worse. Oh my God, no place for the divine comedy. You are now cut out of the meeting. Uh, I, I well, have heard a very good translation of that. A very interesting uh, modern one. That was a throwaway comment, so let's not worry about that. <laughs> but what I did want to say is the National Theatre, as of today, have Jane Eyre, their production of Jane Eyre from sometime in the last 10 years up on YouTube. Hmm. Although I tend to hate adaptations of that because they almost always cut Miss Temple, which I find to be one of the most important setup parts for the main story. I have read that novel sometime <laughs> in the last 20 years. But I cannot remember. My, for me, the, the interesting beginning. character is the woman upstairs. She's the interesting <laughs> character. Fair. But, uh, <laughs> reader, I swear I read it at one point. Uh, I read it... Uh, it was weird. It was actually that I picked it up when I was in the United States the first time back in 2003. I was traveling back from Japan and I got the cheapest copy I get, could get in the, in the bookshop I could find, which was Barnes and Noble. And I had a huge difficulty reading it because they'd re they'd reconformed it for an American audience. So they changed the spellings of words. So the word color, was spelled without the U, and it's like, I'm having a sort of a seizure every time I'm reading this respelt word. Um, <laughs> so it was, uh, 
I may not have the best experience of it, I will just say. I want to show you guys on my bookshelf. There is my pretty copy of Jane Eyre. And cool. speaking of misspellings of things, can you read that? Nook in... No, I do. No, I can't read it. Wait, it might be A K S P E A R E. Oh yes, yeah. I see now. Sorry, I thought you were reading Shax the fight over thing. Uh, it's, it's, Is this the Klingon? It's mirror. Shakespeare. Oh my god! It's a really, Fair. really like eighteen hundreds old copy okay. of Shakespeare that's spelled Shakespeare. That would be Shaw. Shaw did that shit. <laughs> and Speaking. it also came with this spelled right. Um, William Shakespeare. Um, oh, that's from Birmingham. Some yeah. specs and enter fee price one shilling. Yeah, Liz, what were you about to say? Sorry. Speaking <laughs> of Klingon, I heard a couple years ago. I'm sorry. This is going somewhere. I promise. If you're talking uh, about Star somebody... Trek, it's definitely going somewhere. <laughs> Straight to my heart. <laughs> and farther than anyone has gone before. Um. <laughs> I heard there was a company that translated Hamlet into Klingon. Yep, Klingon. I have it. <laughs> it was published. And that's <laughs> baffling to me. No, they did production of it. And that's baffling to me, because if you're going to pick a Shakespeare production to translate into Klingon, you pick Macbeth. You don't yeah. pick Hamlet, which is literally all about this one guy who cannot do anything. That's antithetical to Klingons. Whereas, on the other hand, you've got a story about honor and, you know, do I betray my house? Like, that's literally the most Klingon story in the freaking world. How do you not translate that into Klingon? I mean, if you go for a slight, a pre, um, pre next gen Klingon, you could go with Richard the <laughs> Third. That could also yeah. work. That could also work. And there is a degree to which he is uh, respecting his house by killing the people who are weaker than him in it. Um, Hamlet? Hamlet? Well, that's, that's because of Star Trek VI. That's all that's because of. Because Nick Meyer loved uh, Hamlet and he put through in all these uh, Hamlet references and, you know, you should hear Ham uh, Shakespeare in the original Klingon. And then it's all, you know, Hamlet quotes and Macbeth quotes. Um, but yeah, no, I agree. Apparently, there's a place, I think it's in Minnesota, where normally they do a Klingon Christmas carol every year. <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah, that I've makes so much sense. Sorry, Gary? I said, yeah, I've, I've heard of that as well, yes. Klingon Christmas carols. Yeah. Mm. And there is, there, you can study Klingon at college now, I believe. And I think it it's is on a fully Duolingo. formed language at this point. Sorry? It is a fully formed language, yeah. I am well, almost certain. I am almost certain it's available on Duolingo. Yeah, it's on Duolingo. Good. Anytime I plan on going off world, it would be useful to have another, you know, intergalactic language or as well as Irish. Language. Properly listed as Irish. Good. That might be worth learning. But they don't have Middle English, which I have wanted to learn for a while. Middle English isn't all that dissimilar. It's a, it's a matter of uh, grammars. Foul pronunciations and yeah. unless I'm almost done with that history or caught up rather to the Canterbury Tales and I have like five episodes left of my history of the English language podcast. Cool. So maybe I want to learn Old English. That would be so fun. Old is going to be the so big challenge. I studied Old English in college. Oh. Uh, if, my, if my university had that class... I would have taken it. Oh. I, I took all of the old English classes. So I went to Fordham University and the things you find out after you, you matriculate at a university, for some reason, Fordham University has one of the best medieval studies programs in the United States. And wow. also, if you want to know about like Eastern Orthodox religions, mm. there is a better place to study than Fordham University. Our physics program is shit and almost got discredited. But, uh, you know, medieval studies and uh, Eastern Orthodox faith, if you want to know about it, go to Fordham. Um, yeah. 
we had a ton of really brilliant world-class medieval studies scholars. So I was just like, all right, I'm going to minor in medieval studies. Take advantage of all these brilliant people. So I studied Old English and I never got the hang of it. Um, partly because I'm just crap at learning any languages that aren't American Sign Language. That American Sign Language clicked in my brain, no other language has. Mm -hmm. uh, and have you tried any of the other sign languages? I haven't started um, partly because, well, I, I'm i conversant in American Sign Language, but I'm not really like fluent with it yet. Um, so is American one or two hands? Two hands. I'm sorry, one okay. hand. So British, British I think, is two, two, and Irish is a mix. Really? Yeah, we have, as in, the Irish sign language for English speakers or English users, I should say, is a, a mix of one and two. Because, hmm. of course, we're going to be different. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> I, I remember it was so it's so interesting studying Old English because so little survives from that period that you just read whatever is there. And I remember one of the primary source documents that we, we studied in order to learn Old English was a letter between, it was from a monk who uh, lived in, what was it, Brittany? No, um, North, Northumbria. And his uh, fellow monk moved to, um, Normandy and it was he was he was writing him this letter warning him of all of these dangers that he had heard about secondhand in Normandy <laughs> and there were three so danger number one fairly he'd heard that people Normans just eat blood for fun which okay that's weird if you heard it I don't think warn them warn someone about thing I can two, translate that into reality blood pudding uh Thing number two to warn him about is that Normans had really stupid haircuts and he wanted to warn his, his fellow brother not to get one of these stupid haircuts. Um, Great literature. Thing number three, though, is the most bizarre. Uh, he said he had, he, he spends like a paragraph building it up. It's like, it's so evil and terrible. I don't even want to talk about it, let alone put it into words. It's horrible. And he says, I have heard that in Normandy, there are women who eat while they're on the crapper. And those <laughs> horrible, unfathomable things. So we're reading this in class, translating it, and we're looking through our dictionaries, and it's just like, no, I translated that wrong. And my teacher's like, yes. <laughs> that is quality. I, I also that is just think gold. The music of Old English and Middle English, it sounds so pretty, but like, there have been a couple of times, it sticks out in my mind, like, in <laughs> class when we started studying the Canterbury Tales, my professor who had experience living in Europe and France, like, 50 years ago as an actor, like, just being a cool person who would come back and be a tiny, wonderful, sweet professor, um, started speaking in Middle English and reciting from memory the Canterbury Tales. When we had to memorize the Shakespeare monologue for him, I went into his class and he was like, okay, go, and just closed his eyes, because he knew all of it. <laughs> <laughs> and then when I got to study in England, we went to, everyone in the program went to lectures together, and the very first lecture was the best, and it was a medieval scholar, and she just like starts reading things in Old English and it sounds so pretty. The music of the language is gorgeous. And I have such a fascination for the sounds of language, especially the sounds that developed into the languages that I currently speak. It's one of the reasons why to bring it back to Shakespeare, I really love everything I've seen with original pronunciation. I just love mm -hmm. the music and the rhythm of it. Puns <sighs> too. Like you yes. find wordplay that Shakespeare intended that we had no idea was there. And most yeah. of it's dirty jokes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the literature is not strained. It is <laughs> masturbated. <laughs> <sighs>
What was, do, do you know, I need to find a medieval English textbook and just start teaching myself. <laughs> Beowulf? Years ago. No, that's Beowulf. English. Kinnawulf is the shorter one, isn't it? Sorry, what? Kinnawulf. Isn't that the shorter of the two? Not in Beowulf? Uh, Beowulf is definitely longer. It's yeah. the longest fragment of <clears throat> English that. Oh, well, there we go. I believe. Because I remember friends, again, I never had the luxury of going any earlier than shit. Uh, oh, in, Wolf. Okay. Dude, that's the one. Ah. I'm yeah, pretty. Yeah. That's my dig. <laughs> Supportive laughter. I approve. Um, Kuno Wolf, then, yeah. That's what, like 45 lines or something like that? Or am I getting the arse ways? Well, that's the name of the author. I don't remember what the work is. But... Oh! I know what you're talking about because I heard about that on my podcast. It's short poems and he basically hid his name. Yes. In the yes, poem. I remember that. He like, was... he like put runes into the poems to replace yeah. certain sounds or letters and those runes spelled out Cunewolf, which was yes. the poet's name. Yes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the one that I always know, think of is the one that's translated roughly as I am of Ireland and of the holy land of Ireland. Come dance with me in Ireland, which <laughs> is, I believe, one of the earliest fragments. I mean, you know better than I. It's the one that we obviously hear about in my country. <laughs> one of the things studying Old English did, uh, for me at least, was... Um... J.R.R. Tolkien becomes a lot less genius and creative when you study Old English. Because like, oh, here, let me give you Arendelle. It is for, you know, it's the light to my people. It's the morning star. Hey, what's the Old English word for a morning star? Oh, it's Arendelle. Yeah. Okay. Hey, my name is, I, I'm a, what is it? Not Rohan. Who's the king of Rohan? Theoden. My name is Theoden. I'm the king of Rohan. Cool. What does Theoden mean in Old English? It means king. He's king. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. We in Middle Earth. Oh, what's the Old English word for Earth? Midanyard, which means Middle Earth. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. just... <laughs> I mean, and he has an interesting translation of Beowulf. Does he do that? I know Shane. Yeah, it's in response. Seamus Heaney has... Yes, I love Seamus um, Heaney's band. I it's love so Seamus Heaney's. I will say, J.R.R. Tolkien's is not my favorite, but it is very interesting because Seamus Heaney made it, played a lot into the sounds of the language and playing a lot with the sounds of Middle English language, playing with the kinnings, making it very rhythmic, pleasurable to read. And it's a very strong translation if you are going for a very readable translation. Yeah, J.R.R. Tolkien's a very poetic translation. J.R.R. Tolkien's is much more literal. It's yeah. trying to get to the literal translation of the Middle English, so it's successful, but it's also, they're both successful translations, but they also have very different goals. I think introducing it to someone, first off, no, no contest, send them to Seamus Heaney because they're going to have yeah. a better time getting into it. But if you're starting to be like, wow, Middle English is cool, it's a good idea to look at J.R.R. Tolkien's. Also, um, just FYI, it's very, he drops a lot of like Irish slang in it from place to place, which Not is. At all. That's how normal people talk. <laughs> <laughs> Did you know Martin once saw Seamus Heaney at a Russian embassy and he. Right, gave the his Russian embassy in the old Soviet. So Ireland's a really small place. I've met she I, I met Seamus Heaney four or five different times over the years. Wow. Lovely guy. Really lovely guy. It's so small. I mean, the population of Ireland at the time is about half of what the population of New York at night is. You know, we have a population of maybe 4.5 million now. And if you're living in, if you're any, of any note, you're in Dublin, which is a population of 1.1. .1. So... You'd be surprised who you don't know if you're living in Dublin. And of course, he's well known throughout the country because we're a land yeah. of, uh, of, uh, of, he's famous elsewhere, he must be good. <laughs> oh yeah, he's a poet too. But um, our current president <laughs> is a poet, by the way. Um, but 
<laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm queuing up for me visa to go to the to Russia in what was the old Soviet Union embassy, and it feels like a Soviet Union embassy. Uh, you guys would not know what that is over here. So I'm in in there queuing up, and you know I, I hear a little of a mutter ahead. Is that is that anyone? Is that anyone? And then this sort of this, and then this quiet. And I look up, it's, oh, it's fucking James Heaney. Of course, because, you know, he goes places. <laughs> There's another story about Brendan Bean, one of our playwrights, who, which is similar. It's like, uh, he, he gets on the bus, Mammy, Mammy, is that Brendan Bean? Is that Brendan? <laughs> mammy, Mammy. Yes, it's fucking Brendan Bean, says Brendan Bean back to the kid, who's like four. <laughs> um, but uh, so he's up ahead and there's like, people are going, that's, that's your man, isn't it? It's your man, yes. Shut up, shut up, don't, don't let him know that we know who he is. We don't want him to get notions. Anyway, we're going, queuing up and we do the usual thing of you get to the top of the queue in the Russian embassy and they ask you for a form and no matter what form you have, the first time you go up, you get sent back to fill out another form. And we all know we're going to have to do this, especially the ones who've done it before. It does not matter what form you have, you will have to go and fill in another one. So we get to the top, and he gets the spiel and he gets sent it down. He goes and he stands, he's scribbling away. He's, the guy's in his, I'd say, early 70s at this point. Lovely guy, though. So uh, I get, do my thing, get back get back into the queue. I'm a little bit closer to him because, you know, Seamus Heaney's getting old. He takes longer to fill out these forms. So it's like, I'm only three people behind Seamus Heaney now, but I don't have anyone to go, is that, that's, that's your man, that's your man. To. So I'm there queuing up behind, and he gets to the top. And the, uh, the usual Russian embassy guy says, Nen. And he's like, well, it's uh, Nen. Oh, uh, Seamus Heaney. Sorry, sorry? Seamus Heaney. And the entire place goes, <laughs> he said his name. <laughs> and then worse is to come. Next, he asks, uh, profession. <laughs> And this is Seamus Heaney, who had been a school teacher, who had been a lecturer and all these different things, but for the vast majority of his life has been known for being a poet. That is what he's gotten all his jobs since he was a primary school teacher for. Profession. And poor old Seamus, he sort of looks around over his shoulders and says, what do I say to this man? And he turns back and very quietly but the entire room had gone silent because everyone wants to know, is Seamus Heaney going to say he's a poet? He's a fucking poet. Seamus Heaney's a poet. <laughs> and he turns back and as quietly as he can, which is still because your man is going to shout, profession, if he doesn't say it loud enough. He says, retired school teacher. And the whole room goes, <laughs> oh. <laughs> Lovely guy. He didn't deserve that. <laughs> but we love him for it. Because, you know, he's a retired school teacher who happens to be the most famous poet in the world at the time. You know? <laughs> Not that I love that story or anything. I just, when you bring it up, I suppose I'll tell it. Yeah, but being a poet, that's not a profession. I mean, you can't make a, you can't make a living at that. <laughs> no, God, no. Oh. Sadly, no. My break broke down five blocks from my house and turns out I probably broke down next to the fa most famous poet in the neighborhood and um yeah got some seeds from my from my neighbor Jin and her husband Brown Whitehead <laughs> ah I've heard of him I'm I'm the guy who I've heard of John Prine I've heard of these people I'm not expert so I know Wendell Berry is a big deal poetically speaking isn't he I dated his grandson Cool. Um, again, I've not heard of him, but again, we had so many bloody poets. I also really like his writing. Sorry, you don't care for the writing? No, I also really like his oh, writing. Good. That's I've never relief. met him, but I dated his grandson, and I really like his writing. <laughs> yeah. Good. Good. That is always a relief when you like poets you're related to, which is not a thing I've normally had to say outside of Ireland. Um, <laughs> every other bloody person in Ireland has published something at some point. So, you know, it's like, if you want to make a name for yourself, don't publish anything. You'll stand out from the crowd. 
Anyway, we're getting on to winding up time for me as I've got, you know, a child who will wake me up first thing in the morning and a wife who might like to see me at some point this evening. <laughs> Silent, so probably not. Um, in, the, in summation, does anyone want to sum up everything or make a final firebrand style point? All of the tragedies are good except for Timon of Athens. <laughs> Fair enough. Anyone else want to make a declamatory statement that will haunt you for the week? <laughs> I'm all out of declamations. <laughs> Liz? Got last chance to get the boot in on Hamlet. How <laughs> <laughs> was cool instead. Um, so uh, the when I read an interview the, from uh, the actors at Gallaudet, which is a deaf university, who put out regular Shakespeare productions, and they say they've got an advantage over other uh, theater productions because uh, through the realities of sign language, they get stage directions from Shakespeare uh, in the way that their bodies have to move when they're delivering their lines. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And sign language is generally, from what I can tell as somebody who does not sign it, it seems very um, intuitive in a way that sometimes a uh, kanji script in uh, Japanese can be, if that makes it's sense. It's very performative mm. and spatial. Uh, so, um, also funny uh, <gasps> in, in strange ways. Like, do you know what the sign, do you know what the sign for spinach is? No. In ASL? Popeye! <laughs> really? That's fabulous. Really? That makes sense. I know, makes I, know a sense. Handful, I know a handful of signs and they're either from a Jesus song I learned as a kid or just ones that are funny, like... <laughs> <laughs> so, you now have to tell me what that is. Poop. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, but there, so it's a sign for shit, but there's actually two signs for shit in ASL. Uh, there's that shit, which is either excrement, all of this is shit. But if you're trying to say, oh shit, like, uh -huh. oh man, I f***ed up, that's this sign. <laughs> this face might be on me for the rest of the night knowing that. <laughs> that, that for me is my uh, what Chris Pratt face. Wow, that's fabulous. <laughs> it is an interesting thing, and I think it applies to Shakespeare as well, though. Uh, you know, again, that psychology of a language and the language mm -hmm. lost and the meanings gone with it. You know, um, yeah, we use the same word. I mean, what is it? I remember putting together a very short a, a play once. That was literally called the one minute zombie fuck play, where we use the word fuck 23 different times, but it means something else each time, but we only use that word. Think, oh, fuck. Oh. You know that kind of way that, you know, it's all performance type stuff. And including apparently one question. Fuck? Yeah, yes. <laughs> Did you see that? No, you just told me about it. Oh, I and, I have a, and I have a memory that. Uh, stuff just like sticks in here. It's weird. But um, but we use this one word so many ways, you know. Uh, similarly, so it, other word, other things that might be translated is a single word. A uh, single word doing for multiples, it's the reverse. Like in Ireland, we have about twenty different, uh, seven to ten different ways of saying uh, rain that are very very different that I would not see as being the same. And, oh, about 12 different ways of saying somebody was drunk. He was plastered, he was langered, he was smashed, he was uh, three sheets, and so on and so forth. I think most cultures have that, but how we say that is different. So that's an exciting thing to know about uh, two different ways of saying shit. <laughs> that is fantastic. And I think that is very appropriate. Uh, yeah. Oh, shit. Uh, Something shit, yes. Something oh shit. Yeah. That is the note we need to leave on, I think. <laughs> that is the note we need to leave on. 
Um, Kentucky Shakespeare is showing Comedy of Errors next uh, tomorrow. Um, let's talk about comedies the next day. And guess where this is leading to history's fans in a week's time after that? Comedies uh, next week? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Just the general. I mean, if somebody has an idea, great. I just like to have people somewhat prepared for, oh, wait, we're going to talk about something I'm, I'm not that saying prepared for, but been thinking about. Uh, on that, uh, on right. those, on those. Good night, sir. Or whatever. Yeah. See you. Uh, see you next week. Take care. Good night. Good night. Good night, everyone.